For the mega fave number playlist, I want to talk about a number that personally annoys me immensely. And that is the number of theoretically unaccounted for Romans in ancient Rome in 14 AD. It's 4,933,001 people. It's going to highlight some of the massive flaws in the Roman numerals, but also some of the great parts of the Hindu Arabic numeral system. Enjoy! In 14 AD, the Romans held a census. No, not that one. They discovered something very interesting. There were 4,937,000 Roman citizens living in Italy at the time. Firstly, suggesting that Romans have letters of exactly 1,000, but secondly, and more importantly, Roman numerals, the things, you know, that Romans used to count with, only go up to 3,999. Which, first of all, why the heck do Roman numbers only go up to 3,999? But second, how do they account for the other 4,933,001 Roman citizens running around Rome? Now, obviously the Romans could count higher than 3,999. I mean, they were the ones who made the census. But how? How could they count higher than their numbers could go? And What's it mean for numbers to stop? Numbers don't stop. They just keep going and going and going and going and going forever, like like a slinky down an infinite staircase. Well, I guess actually numbers go up, so be a slinky up an infinite staircase. Okay, the slinky analogy breaks down, but you totally get my point. Numbers don't stop. They go forever. But think about this. This is not five. This is the symbol we use for five. And even the word five is not really what five is. It's just the word we give the concept in English. And in different languages, it has a different word. For example, single, single. And in different cultures, there's also different symbols used to represent five. And we call these symbols number systems. So say you're trying to design a number system from scratch, meaning you're trying to devise a way to describe all of the numbers with some symbols. The most obvious thing to do is to start with the symbol for one. Let's just call one a drawing of a finger. Okay, then what's two? No big deal, just a drawing of two fingers. Three, drawing of three fingers, four, drawing of four fingers, five, five fingers, etc., etc., like that, until you get to ten. Now, we could designate this symbol with ten fingers to mean ten, but this is getting tiresome. I mean, Picasso and Thanksgiving couldn't draw this many fingers. So, how about instead we think outside the box and make a new symbol to designate ten? Say a fist bump. After all, a fist bump's got ten fingers, right? So, this is our symbol for ten. And then 11 is easy. It's just the fist bump with the finger tacked on. And 12 is just a fist bump with two fingers tacked on. You see where this is going. We can keep going like this till you get to 19, which that's easy. It's just a fist bump with nine fingers tacked on. And then 20, once again, it's two sets of 10. So instead of drawing a fist bump and 10 fingers, just draw two fist bumps. And we could easily use just these two symbols to label all the numbers up to 99. And 99 itself is fine. It's just nine fist bumps with nine fingers tacked on. But what's 100? I mean, we could use 10 fist bump symbols, but that's so many fist bumps. What is this, a frat party? Nine's my limit, okay? So how about we make a new symbol for 100? And then 101 is going to be that symbol for 100 with a finger tacked on, and it goes on and on and on and on like this. We just keep making a new symbol when we get tired of writing a lot of the old ones. And this is exactly the type of system the ancient Egyptians landed on. Except instead of using fingers and fist bumps, they use these crazy symbols right here for 1, 10, and 100. And they even had symbols for a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, a million, and ten million. Not what I would have gone personally, but what are you going to do? So for example, in ancient Egyptian, this number, 314,159, the number of hearts I've broken, would look like this, with three symbols for a hundred thousand, one for ten thousand, four for a thousand, one for a hundred, five for ten, and nine symbols for one. Well, it's simple enough if you're only trying to write numbers around ten million or so. Like, say, the number of bricks in a particularly nice pyramid. But what if you want to go bigger? Say ancient Egyptian science advanced a little bit and some eager beaver grad student wants to know how much water flows through the Nile in a day. After all, water flow is a very important metric for beaver society. And that's a simple enough question to ask, right? But it turns out the answer is 2,083,300,000 cubic cubits of water a day, which in Egyptian would be written like this. With 208 symbols for 10 million, with three symbols for a million and three symbols for a hundred thousand tacked on. See, since they didn't have a symbol for a billion, the Egyptians would have to write these 208 symbols for a million. This is an unfeasible way to write numbers, especially with a chisel. Now, if you're anything like the people in parks I yell this at, you're probably thinking right now, so what? Big deal. The Egyptian numbers didn't go past 10 million, but they weren't tracking water flow. They had numbers big enough for everything they needed. So what? 
Big deal? The big deal is that math paves the road for science. Newton couldn't put his theory of gravity to use without first discovering calculus. Maxwell couldn't connect electromagnetism and light without first someone discovering partial differential equations. You see, the quality of a culture's math is a limiting factor in how far their science can go. Arguably, the Egyptians didn't have a limited number system because their science didn't need it. Their science didn't need it because they had a limited number system. They could not advance their science without at first advancing their math. And as simple as it sounds, writing down numbers efficiently is at the foundation of a culture's mathematics. But it's possible I'm getting too excited about math again. My big issue is that the Egyptians couldn't write a number as big as the water flow number. But in the real world, they wouldn't really need to write all those big suns and weird VeggieTale monsters. They could instead just define a new symbol for 100 million. And then when they got past that, to find a new symbol for a billion, on and on and on and on. But where does it end? The numbers keep going and going and going and going, so the Egyptians have to keep coming up with more and more and more symbols. Infinitely many, in fact. And if we're honest, they were reaching with these seven. I mean, what is this guy? All right, all right, I'm getting heated. Let me count down from five. V, I, V, I, 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 I. That's right, we're talking about Roman numerals. The Roman numerals are, of course, the number system of ancient Rome. And even though we call the ancient Romans and ancient Egyptians both ancient, the ancient Romans came along thousands of years after the ancient Egyptians. And in those thousands of years, they somehow managed to make their number system worse. And it is truly the worst. I mean, check this out. So on the face of it, the Roman system looks a lot like the Egyptian system. There's a symbol for 1, 10, 100, 1,000, and then you have symbols for 5, 50, and 500, which is kind of neat. But unlike the Egyptians who kept things simple in between, the Romans added some terrible, Terrible rules to govern how you use these symbols to write numbers. You know, the Romans and their laws. Mainly, they added the idea of subtraction. As you all probably know, to write 1 in Roman numerals, you just write I. And then to write 2, you write I, I. Two symbols for 1, just like how the Egyptians write 2 as two of their symbols for 1. And then 3 is just three I's. But for some reason, once you get to 4, it gets weird. It's not just four I's, that would be too simple. Instead, they write IV, which in Roman is to be read as take I, 1, away from 5. So they basically write 4 as 5 minus 1. Then to write 5, you just write V. And 6 is V with an I tacked on, just like you'd expect. 7's VII, and then 8 is V with 3 I's. But at 9, it gets weird again for no reason. Instead of writing V with 4 I's, they write IX, which is to mean take I, 1, away from X, 10. Now, in a lot of situations like this, you can write a smaller symbol in front of a larger symbol to indicate subtraction. But there's a lot of complicated and confusing rules to govern exactly how this works, so be careful. Or don't. I mean, Roman numerals are really only used for like your grandma's clock in the Super Bowl, so it really doesn't matter. But anyway, this subtraction leads the Romans to an unwritten rule. Never write four of the same symbols in a row. The reason being, whenever you write four of the same symbols consecutively, it would just be easier to write the next largest symbol and use the subtraction thing. You don't write 4 as 4 i's, but iv. And you don't write 40 as 4 x's, but as xl. And this goes on and on like this until you get to 4,000, which you shouldn't write as 4 m's, but as the symbol for 5,000 minus the symbol for 1,000. But here's the problem. The Romans in their infinite wisdom just don't have a symbol for 5,000, or anything greater for that matter. The Roman numerals just stop in their tracks at 4,000, the largest number you're able to write being 3,999, which isn't even four pictures worth of words. Talk about limiting. But, 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 the Roman numerals do do one thing interesting. It might not be good, but it's interesting. It puts importance not only on the look of a symbol, but also its position in the number. Follow me here for a second. In the ancient Egyptian system, the position of a symbol doesn't really change the meaning of a number. We tend to write 25 as two tens and five ones, but it wouldn't change the meaning at all if we wrote five ones and two tens, or even one ten, three ones, another ten, and two more ones. The position of the symbol does not change the value of the number. The Egyptians have a straight additive system. Every symbol represents a number, and to find the value of a combination of symbols, you just add together those numbers. However, with Roman numerals, the position of a symbol can very much matter. For example, the Roman numeral for 19 is XIX, while the Roman numeral for 21 is XXI. Both numerals are the same symbols, just in different positions, but it totally changes the meaning of the number. This is because in XIX, the I is being subtracted from the total, while in XXI, the I is to be added. 
See, the position of the eye totally changes its meaning in the number. And this is the key to everything. The meaning of a symbol is not only determined by what it looks like, but also its position and context in the number. The same way this goat emoji can mean two very different things based on its context and position. So the big issue with the ancient Roman and Egyptian systems is that it became mad cumbersome to write big numbers. The reason being, they are both stuck in this idea that the number a symbol represented is entirely determined by what the symbol looks like. So in order to write bigger numbers, you have to invent brand new symbols to represent those bigger magnitudes. But they missed the key idea. What if, instead of writing bigger numbers by inventing more and more new symbols, we instead represent bigger numbers by using the existing symbols we have, just in different positions? Let's start from scratch and make a new number system based on this idea. First, let's say that this symbol here represents 1. Or at least it represents 1 when it's in the first position. When it's in the second position, we're going to say it represents 10. In the third position, it represents 100, fourth, 1,000, on and on like that. Then, you can see with this one symbol, we can represent all the powers of 10, things like 1, 10, 100, 1,000, just by changing the position of the symbol. But we're going to a little hiccup. This is great for writing numbers like 1, 10, 100, those cool kids. But what about a crazy weird number like, I don't know, 2? The ancient Romans and Egyptians would say, just write your symbol for 1 right next to itself twice. But in our new system, they would actually represent 1 plus 10, which is 11, not 2. So we're going to need a new symbol for 2. And again, at 3, we need a new symbol because the standard way to write 3, the 1, 1, 1, actually stands for 111 in this notation. And again, we need a new symbol for 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. But then we're good. We have everything we need to label all of the infinitely many natural numbers with just these 10 symbols. How? See, we apply the positional rule we applied to 1 to the rest of the gang here, too. So 2 in the first position represents 2, but in the second position it represents 20, in the third 200, fourth 2000, etc. Then, as long as you get the right symbols in the right positions, you can write down literally any number you want and do it pretty easy, too. So for example, let's say you're trying to write a really big number, like, I don't know, 4,937,000, let's say. The way you do that is you write a 4 in the 7th position to represent 4 millions, then a 9 in the 6th position to represent 9 hundred thousands, a 3 in the 5th position for 3 ten thousands, and a 7 in the 4th position to represent 7 thousands. If you want to get real fancy, you can even make up a symbol for 0. And then the last three positions here, you can write 0, 0, 0 to represent how there is no 100s, 10s, or 1s to add. And then notice with this new symbol, you can easily write down any single number, memorizing very few rules. It all just works itself out, freeing up brain power to focus on things like, I don't know, algebra, accounting, spending quality time with your video editor, anything. And this is exactly what the ancient Hindus did. It should be no surprise that the positions people came up with the most famous positional number system of all time. It came included with a zero even. And I'm skipping so much here. Like, why we consider these positions represent powers of 10 and not, say, 2, 3, or 12. Or how we do arithmetic in any of these systems. Or what a monumental achievement just a symbol for zero is on its own. Let me know if you want to see a deep dive on any of these topics in the comments below. But I'm way off topic. We've got to bring it back to Italy. See, in modern day Italy and the West and most of the world, we use what I've been calling the modern day number system, which is really just a Hindu number system with some recasting of the symbols. How does this ragtag, totally original number system from India overthrow the Roman numerals which had entrenched themselves in Europe for over a thousand years? Well, it all comes down to this one Italian guy, you may know him by his sequence, Fibonacci. Yes, Fibonacci, who was kicking in the 11 and 1200s, was an amazing pre-Renaissance mathematician slash trust fund kid. And his famous sequence is probably one of the least important things he ever did. Most important? While studying abroad in the Islamic world, he discovered the Hindu-Arabic numerals. And he came to realize the great power of having a number system where you could, I don't know, count, add, subtract, and multiply easily. Have you ever seen a two-digit Roman numeral multiplication? It looks like someone threw up alphabet soup all over a Sudoku. But I digress. The point is, the Hindu-Arabic number system is great at arithmetic. And what's one really useful thing to count, add, subtract, and multiply? Money. With the spread of Hindu-Arabic numerals to Europe, all of a sudden governments, banks, and businesses had access to an accounting power they never had before. And they could run more complex and lucrative organizations. And what happened immediately after 1200? The Renaissance, the Scientific Revolution, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, the Dance Dance Revolution, etc. 
right after Fibonacci dropped the Hindu Arabic numerals on Europe. A coincidence? Probably not. But oh yeah, let's go back to how the hell the Romans managed to count almost 5 million people when their number system only went up to 3,999. Well, they saw the limitations in their own system, and they botched together some new symbols to modify what they already had. Like a line over a numeral meant to multiply it by 1,000, and two lines on the side and one on top meant to multiply it by 100,000. So our number, the number of Roman citizens in Italy in 14 AD, 4,937,000, could be written like this, or this, or maybe even this. It's unclear whether all these would be allowed or once considered standard, all of these notations were added ad hoc because they needed more numbers. So could they do it? Yes, they could. They could count that high. There weren't really 4,900,000 unaccounted for Romans in Italy at the time. But the story of the hoops they had to jump through shows the limitations of their number system, and it highlights how amazingly useful the Hindu Arabic numerals have been on the world. So today in our modern world, with the benefit of growing up with Hindu Arabic numerals, you might think that the Egyptian and Roman systems are straight up silly, but they're not. It took some of the smartest people of their day to even think of that. Remember back when I was doing the finger fist bump system, and once I got to 10 fingers, I got lazy and said, oh my gosh, who would write more than 10 symbols? Let's add a second symbol. Well, there have been plenty of cultures around the world that never got to the stage of adding a second symbol. They just kept writing down more and more of their symbols to one to make higher numbers. You might laugh now, ha ha ha, us in our modern world are so sophisticated with our fancy number systems and TikToks and antibiotics. But unless, wait, have you ever been to an eccentric old person's birthday party? Counting each year with one candle? No way, you're way too smart for that. Unless, have you ever tallied up numbers like this? Yep, we're not so different from the ancient Romans after all. But we're also not so different from the ancient Hindus. So maybe we too can question our assumptions, not just take what's already there, not just take what's obvious, but be a little more clever, a little more efficient, and in the process, change the world. Hey there everybody, that's our video, that's what we got. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, tell us how we did, we plan on making a lot more of these. And, I don't know, read an audiobook if you want. I don't care, get a VPN, free country. Do what you want to do. Have a good day. <laughs>